Episode 167 of CPP Cast with guest Anders Knotten, recorded September 12th, 2018. Today's sponsor of CPP Cast is the PVS Studio team. PVS Studio can be considered both as a tool for finding errors and typos and a static application security testing tool. The tool supports the analysis of C, C++, and C Sharp code. In this episode, we discussed the C++ Alliance announcement, then we talked to Andrews Knotten. Andrews talks to us about cppquiz.org and more. Welcome to episode 167 of CVP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Getting ready for CPP Con. How about you? Um, I'm doing okay. Uh, we do have a, a pretty bad storm bearing down on us in the Carolinas, though. Uh, it's beautiful weather out today, but uh, it's supposed to be hitting tomorrow night, I believe. It's just some little tropical thing, right? Uh, it's a Cat 4. Yeah, or a hurricane, so it could be bad. Um, I, I've been like tracking the weather uh, regularly on my phone, looking at the satellite, and you know they have the they call it the cone of uncertainty, right? And and two days ago, the the center line of that cone was literally going right through my town, um, but it has since shifted uh, <laughs> further and further south. Uh, it's currently aimed more at South Carolina. Um, I think the whole coast is still going to get hurt pretty bad, and we'll probably still get some. Heavy rains and winds here, um, and I think I am probably going to actually edit and publish this episode tonight instead of tomorrow in case I lose power. So, so when is it actually supposed to hit you? I believe it's supposed to start Thursday night into Friday. Okay. Something like Do you, that. What is the current forecast? I'm curious for how many, what the wind speed will be when it land, make, makes it to your area. I, I don't know what it'll that. be by the time it gets to our area, but I know it's got like 140 mile per hour winds right now. 140, okay. It's pretty bad. I, I saw someone, one of the astronauts up on the ISS shared a picture of the hurricane, and he had to use like a wide-angle lens in order to <laughs> see the entire hurricane from space. <laughs> wide-angle lens from space. Yeah. So that's about 200 and something kilometers per hour for our non-US <laughs> listeners. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, if you're listening to this episode early on, on Thursday instead of Friday and you're wondering why, it's because I'm... Uh, Worried about possibly losing power later this week. All right. Yeah. Well, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> well, a top ever sort of like your piece of feedback. Uh, this week we got a tweet um, from Ama, and the tweet was actually written, I, I believe, in Arabic. But uh, Twitter has the lovely translate tweet button, which works pretty well. And uh, he, you know, made this tweet about how he loves listening to technical podcasts, and said that he's currently listening to the archive of CPP Cast and CPP Chat, and they're easing the burden of congestion. And I looked it up, and he's uh, from Kuwait. Wow! So, yeah, we got listeners all over the place. That's cool. And I like I know absolutely no Arabic whatsoever. No, I mean it's it's a very unique, different language yeah. compared to English. Yeah. I get- I guess I actually know a few spoken words, but I can't read no. a single character of it. No. <laughs> Neither can I. <laughs> uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us today is Anders Knotten. Anders is here as the author of cppquiz.org. He's been working as a programmer since 2001 in fields ranging from multi-phase flow simulation to web development. He's been doing everything from working on compilers to being CTO and has been using a wide variety of languages. C++ is closest to his heart, but he's been doing other things for the last five years. He's very happy to be back as a C++ developer from October 1st in his new job at Zivid Labs. Anders is also a father of two, and in his spare time, he's the producer and frontman of the future pop band Modulo One. Anders, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. That sounds like there's a lot going on, but um, I, I do <laughs> yeah. want I want to ask 
So you say you're just now moving back into C++ development. How long has it been since you were doing C++ professionally? Um, it's, uh, I think it's actually, yeah, 2013. So the summer of 2013. So about Which is years. actually, yeah, that's actually the same summer that I launched C++ Quiz. Uh, not knowing that I would depart from C++ professionally <laughs> at that time. But, uh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, so is your move back into C++ directly related to your work on CPP Quiz? Um, well, kind of, uh, because, yeah, it's, I've been kind of forced to keep up with C++ in at least a, uh, a little bit by, mm -hmm. because of the site. And, uh, yeah, when I decided to find something new, um, C++ was kind of a natural thing to go into because I had a quiz, I had a blog and I know a lot of people and I really like a lot of people in the community and yeah, so I've always kind of felt at home with C++. And I uh, went to my first C++ Focus conference for five years, uh, just a few weeks ago, and it was just like, yeah, I'm I'm back. <laughs> it's, uh, it was a really, yeah, really nice uh, just to see everyone and uh, yeah, get back to the things I'm mostly interested in. Yeah. I I would think that it would be hard after five years away to get another job using C++, but on the other hand, since you've stayed connected to the community for the last five years, that must have made it much easier. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, yeah, the the job I got was I had two two people I knew who knew people there, and so that kind of set up set that deal up. But also having still blogged a bit and having the C++ quiz uh, just made made it quite easy actually, because I would say, "Hey, my name is Sanders. I have this site and this blog and stuff." And they go, "Okay, we'll talk wow. to this guy." <laughs> it's it's like one of those things where you have this privilege of actually having the time to do those kinds of things, uh, which make people notice you. So. Yeah, <laughs> Lucky I guess that that's way. a good a good reason. If we have any listeners who have been thinking about blogging or or starting a project and haven't yet, you should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, not not everyone are fortunate enough to have the time to actually do all of these things. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, this summer I interviewed with actually a lot of places uh, because I really wanted to find something really cool to work on, and. I noticed it really helped to have something to refer to. So here's my quiz site or here's my open source stuff or here's my blog or something like that. And also having worked with recruiting myself, uh, you tend to notice <laughs> these things, I think. Hmm. But uh, it's, it's also an important bias to be aware of when you're recruiting people because not everyone has the time and possibility to do all these things, but they yeah. can still be good programmers. So it's, yeah, it's important to, to be aware of, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But if you can, do it, yeah. Definitely. Okay, well, Andrews, we got a couple of news articles to discuss. Uh, feel yeah. free to comment on any of these, then we'll start talking more about CVP quiz, okay? Yeah. And okay. it does seem that our news is a bit light lately. Yeah, I think that might just be kind of leading towards CPPCon. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of news afterwards. It's also just the end of the summer and schools are starting back up, so people might just be busy. Maybe not yeah, much news for those reasons. It, it is interesting to... To, to ponder how many people might be holding news back because they're waiting until their <laughs> yeah. talk at CBPCon or product announcement or something like that. Right. Well, anyway, this first announcement we have um, is C++ Alliance. And this is a, a, a new nonprofit organization that's going to be kind of just promoting C++. I, I'm surprised I haven't heard about this before. I, I imagine this maybe took a while to set up. But um, apparently they're going to be sponsoring C++ or CppCon. Mm -hmm. um, they are now sponsoring the Slack, the CPP Lang Slack. And they have staff engineers, including uh, Marshall Clow, who's been a guest on the show, and Damian Jarek. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly it means to be a staff engineer. Like, are they actually employed that. by the charity? Like, that's their full-time job? Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious about that. I don't. I have no idea. And Marshall works on several open source projects, boost related things. So I could totally see him being funded full time to work on things, but I, I have no idea. I, I was kind of most curious about that, and it, yeah, I, I, it says he joined as a staff engineer, and it says previously he worked for Qualcomm. So is he really leaving Qualcomm for C plus plus lines? I, I I want to find out that. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it sounds pretty exciting. Um, this new charitable group working to empower the C++ community. So, I mean, the, the main 
like news items here is that the C++ language Slack is funded now. Right. So Which, we we had a problem with history. Now we do not have a problem right, with history. Because there was a limit if you're using the free version of Slack of like, what, 10,000 messages be backed up or something like that? Something like that. that. And the rate that most messages were being uh, posted, it was basically any particular channel didn't have a history of more than something like about 36 hours. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's how quickly it was getting to the end of that. Um Oh, and, and I did notice on the news on their website that they are over a year old. So what, have we really just been like under a rock or something? Like, how do we miss that if they've been a year old? I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. Um, <laughs> there was also a, a, did you read the first comment from STL on the Reddit post? Uh, I did read through some of that. Um, he was kind of commenting on their, a bit about their website and, and things like that. So he uh, comments that there's a video reel that had been playing on the website that had snapshots of several C++ speakers Uh that he says it creates an impression of association or endorsement, which doesn't seem to be proper if the speakers weren't asked for their approval. Right. So he was one of the people in that snapshot. I was apparently caught up in this also. I did not know that I was used on a video reel on their website. Not that you're necessarily offended by that, but yeah, it would be nice to know. Yeah, right? they have yeah. since taken down that video reel because oh, of okay. the uh, the minor controversies surrounding it. Well, we'll have to talk more to some people involved in this to get a little more detail about it. Uh, John Kolb was a board member, so was Vinnie Falco and uh, Rene Rivera. Yeah, and Jens Veller is involved as well. Yep. Yeah, well, I, I'm definitely curious about this. I want to get some more info. Um Anders, did you hear about this before, like this week? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, so I don't really know any much uh, more than what you do. Okay. Yeah, what about Hilarious? It's good, no, sorry, it's good that, yeah, it's just it's good that the uh, that the uh, Slack is funded, so we get uh, history. Uh, otherwise, I don't really know anything. Right. Like hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry that I interrupted you there. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Uh, and then the next thing we have to discuss is uh, CMake RC, which is a standalone CMake based C resource compiler. Yes. And I think we talked about resource compiling a bit. Um, oh, I just forgot our guest name. Um, but when we were, oh, Jean Heed, we were talking yes. about him with, uh, I was talking about Stood in Bed with him. And that seems to be kind of in the same vein as what this CMake RC is trying to accomplish. Well, I mean, resource comp- uh, you're a Windows developer. Resource compilers yeah. are a normal thing. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that I mean, there's a slightly different thing here because it would be like a const expert, like embed kind of keyword added in C++ if John oh, sure. proposal goes through. Or a yeah. const expert function of some sort. But same, yeah, basic kind of concepts. I, I looked through all this and I'm like... I think I'm going to start using this in about two days on the project that I'm currently working on. Nice. Yeah, it did look pretty cool. And um, I will probably read, I skimmed through the blog post I made about the first implementation, and I'm probably going to refer back to that when time comes that I need to write some CMX stuff myself, because, yeah, it seems like there were a lot to learn from that post as well. So is that a blog post? Uh, where is that blog post that you're referring uh, to? There was, uh, it was referred to from the README, I think. Uh, oh, okay. They had a blog post about the uh, pre-2.0 version that they, could, that they were explaining how they made it. Okay, so I, I see that that The current one is a bit different from, from that, but it's kind of on the same, uh, in the same spirit. So, yeah, I think uh, it's probably going to be something to learn from. And then considering that this is actually compiled into the binary... I do wonder how much of this is const expert and how much of it could be const expert because I, <laughs> I, I want it const expert. Actually, for the project I'm working on right now, const expert not would be irrelevant. But for some projects, I would want it const expert. Hmm. Okay. Well, Anders, uh, why don't we start off? Uh, we already mentioned CVP quiz a little bit, uh, talking about your bio. But can you give us an overview of what exactly CVP quiz is? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh... It's uh, what it says on the on the tin. It's a quiz about C++. <laughs> uh, so you go to the site, uh, you get uh, some uh, C++ programs thrown at you. So there's you get a complete program, usually between maybe 15 and 30 lines uh, with a main function and everything. And your goal is to figure out what's the output of the program. 
And uh, sometimes it doesn't have an output because it's uh, a compilation error that you have to find, or sometimes it's undefined behavior, sometimes it's implementation defined or unspecified behavior. And then you have to select that, okay, this one actually it compiles, but it has unspecified behavior. Um, but I try to keep most of the questions to questions that actually compile and are well-defined and have a determin deterministic output. Uh, so you can just keep going through all those questions, or you can like say, start a quiz, and then you get 10 questions randomly selected. And when you're done, you can share the link with your friends and see uh, if, if they beat you, and you get a score at the end. So yeah, that's I guess that's the uh, gist of it. So those are the four specific options. It is unspecified, undefined, compile error, or yes, it produced output, and this is what it is. Yeah, you select those from a dropdown, and then you have to, f to fill out the output in a little text box. So it's usually like, the output is usually just like one or two or three characters uh, based on which overload was selected or uh, how many times the copy constructor was called or yeah, okay. stuff like that. So the, the output is typically A or one, two, three or A, A, B or something like that based, based on what happens in the program. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a simple format, but not very easy. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean we'll dig into it to more, some more. But I will say I have tried to do some of them, and some of them are challenging. It's subtle. Yeah. Some of them are quite <laughs> subtle. Yeah. I if you challenge me to do it now, I could probably not solve all the questions myself either, <laughs> because at some point I understood everything going on in all the questions. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's some of it is really hard, and some of it is contributed by other people. Uh, in which case I make sure I understand and I read the standard. I make sure I really, really understand it at that time. But a few years later, then, yeah, you forget. <laughs> the standard's only like 1,200 pages. Surely you could just have it memorized <laughs> by now. <laughs> yeah, it, the C++ 11 standard was 1,400, I think. I don't know how long the 17 one is. Oh, right. Well, I mean, I guess we already alluded to this earlier, but how did you decide to start the the project? Um, I was uh, at uh, the ACCU conference in England in 2013, uh, okay. which is a really cool conference. It's kind of uh, small, I would say, or maybe I've been to some really big one. I don't know how, a few hundred people. And everyone is in the same hotel, so basically everyone hangs out in the evening, and it's a very like, uh, nice, uh, nice atmosphere and lots of interesting people. And... Uh, there's a guy called Olve Maudal uh, from uh, Cisco in uh, Norway. He uh, used to have his C++ pub quizzes, and they were really, really fun. I've heard uh, of those. Yeah, and it, uh, so his format is basically the same as mine. He will show uh, a C++ program, and you have to figure out what's, what's going to be the output. Uh, but in his format, the, he, he tells you his compiler and his OS, and the question is, what's the output on my machine? So uh, um, that makes it really interesting for uh, like an interactive format because you can both discuss, okay, what does the standard say? But you can also discuss, huh, so what's going to happen on his computer? So he calls a function uh, with a local variable that he sets, and he calls another function with an, an, an initial S variable. And then that has the value of the local variable from the other function because it just reuses this. <laughs> so then, okay, yeah, so the output is actually three, even though it's an, an initialized. But of course, it's undefined behavior. Uh, so you get these fun discussions. Um, and yeah, and when you do it at the SSU conference, then you have people like uh, Bjarne himself and like, people in the, in the other teams that you can compete with. So the competition is pretty, pretty hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been to one of those, and then I've been to the pub for a few more hours, and uh, I got back to my hotel room and was thinking I should sleep. Uh, but instead, I figured, hey, someone should make uh, this thing uh, online. And... Uh, yeah, so I started the prototype uh, instead of sleeping, uh, a bit drunk, and uh, that was fun. So I, I kind of finished the prototype on the train and the plane back home uh, two days later. And uh, yeah, then I figured I should actually finish this. So yeah, instead of, uh, instead of cleaning it up, I just added the rest of the features to the prototype and shipped it. So yeah. <laughs> it's not uh, the best quality of the code in the, in the implementation of the site. But it's been up and working for five years or yeah. more than five years now. Yeah, it's like one of the like technically one of the worst projects I've made. Like, <laughs> really, there's no CI except for me running things locally, and uh, yeah, there's no like uh, load balancing running. It's just running on like a shared server in Amsterdam somewhere. Um, but it's a very small, easy project, so it's it's actually has great uptime and it's 
rarely fails, I would say. I don't change it that much either, so yeah. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so the w one important difference from all of the quizzes is that the CPP quiz always asks about what does the standard say. Okay. Um, um, so I think that makes more sense for, for uh, that format where you uh, there's, here is the correct answer. Um, where you don't have that much interactive discussion, I think that's that's better. But for the pub quizzes, it's really fun to with the, the part with what's going to actually happen on my computer part. That's yeah, that's part of the fun. Yeah, I've never really thought about that. I'm still my brain's just a little bit stuck still on the what does it do on my computer? The deterministic, undefined behavior, basically. Yeah. Like I know with this compiler, this is always going to happen because of the way it manages the stack, but it's undefined behavior. <laughs> that's mm. yeah. And then the correct crazy. answer is uh, is three, but you get I think you get bonus points if you can then explain also that it's actually undefined behavior, but it's going to print three on your computer. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's how it uh, started, and then I kind of uh, yeah just kept going <laughs> with it. So CVP so, quiz doesn't really have those kinds of questions, really. It's of um, the what would it do on my computer. That is uh, no, no. Okay. All the questions are what does the standard say uh, that's going to happen. And okay. it, in the beginning, I didn't always have references to the standard, but all the questions over the last few years have really detailed uh, references to the standard with quotes explaining why uh, the particular thing is going to happen. So when you manage to get it correctly, uh, then you can read the explanation about, okay, why was this? Uh, why is this the case? Or if you give up, also you will be shown basically almost a blog post sometimes about why is hmm. this the output of the program. Cool. So were a lot of the questions still like inspired from the pub quiz directly? Uh, how'd you go about creating them all? Uh, yeah, some of them, like, although was, like, he's a really, really nice guy. And uh, he's been running the Oslo C++ user group uh, for many years as well. Uh, he just sent me all this material, and I was free to steal from him. And uh, I also got uh, a lot of help from pe other people in the SSU. So on the mailing list, people sent me some of the stuff they had used for quizzes in their companies and stuff like that. Uh, so that was kind of seeded the whole thing with enough questions to publish. And then later, it's, a lot of it is just me reading something somewhere, uh, thinking, hey, this might actually be a bit confusing for someone. Let's see if we can put this into a question. And very often it's actually, I'm reading the standard because I need to understand uh, the reasoning for a question I'm working on. And then I just read a sentence and say, hey, that could actually be a new question. <sighs> so uh, yeah, today I was just randomly reading uh, the fact that if you copy and initialize a list, it doesn't actually copy the elements right. that it's referring to. So then, okay, then again, that's a, that's a new question. Then I can I can put an object in the in an initializer list with a side effect in the copy constructor, and just pass it to a function by value a few times, and then the, the user has to figure out: okay, does it actually copy it when it goes in there or not? So the copy constructor will just print one or something, and then you, yeah. So yeah, that that's often how it uh, happens. Um, at, at one point, I decided I would save some time and I would allow other people to contribute questions. So I made a form where you can like, enter a question and the explanation and the correct answer and everything. Uh, the problem is, of course, that people then submit questions about things I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and I have to understand everything in that question completely with like, how does the, ref the standard actually uh, say that this is actually the, the only uh, behavior <laughs> that's uh, allowed. So I can often spend several hours just reviewing one question from a a user, so I didn't save any time at all. <laughs> I, so you already said that this is like the worst project you've ever written, but do you by any chance have like a workflow or something? So when this comes in, you could send it to other people for review or have other like people help you review the questions? Uh, I haven't really set it up like that now. I did make a separate setup now for, for porting all the questions to C++17. Uh, but other than that, it's just a web form and it goes into the database and I'm the only administrator. Uh, okay. So um, I have a little mailing list, which I almost never use. But if I really get stuck, I ask there. But uh, recently, I've been asking a few times on Stack Overflow as well. And I always <laughs> get uh, this language lawyer tag <laughs> applied to all my questions. I'm not sure if it's an insult or if it's uh, if it's just informative. But uh, yeah, that, that's how it goes. So what yeah, if... I, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, what if someone finds a bug in one of your questions? 
Uh, yeah, that happens. Um, usually, every time I publish a new question, I post it on Twitter. And if I make a mistake, I typically get to know in a few hours by someone on Twitter. Okay. Uh, awesome. Or... I also have a GitHub repo, so people log issues on GitHub. And some of the bug reports are real, and actually quite often they are, hey, I tried this in my compiler, and uh, it says something different. So the quiz must be wrong, because uh, GCC surely has this covered, right? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and often, actually, that's just because it's undefined behavior, but yeah, you reuse a variable or uh, something like that. So... So the compiler side, there's no bug. Like they are just doing whatever, and it's legal, and it's something different than the site says because the site says it's undefined behavior, and someone says no, it's not. My compiler says it's the answer is A B three. Uh, yeah. Right. So, uh, but yeah, so I get I do get real bug reports uh, as well, and that I have to fix. And uh, yeah, sometimes actually uh, bug reports to the quiz end up as bug reports for Clang or GCC. Mm. There's uh, there's one question that I have had multiple bug reports about, and I think the I think Clang and Cpbquiz are correct, and GCC is wrong. But there's a bug uh, for GCC saying that Clang is correct, and there's also a bug on Clang saying that GCC is correct, <laughs> and they're they're both open. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure Clang uh, is is correct. But it's mm. it's about the corner case, I think. So it's not very important. In my experience in the corner cases, if Clang produces one output different from GCC, Clang is more likely to be the correct one, but... Yeah. Yeah. It's usually yeah, things that don't affect real code. Yeah, it's like this is using a decal type on uh, a variable inside of a Lambda. Ah. Uh, and the, var the variable is actually not captured by the Lambda. Uh, so it's not ODR used inside the Lambda, and then it shouldn't be captured. But there's a specific little clause somewhere saying that if you put decal type, decal type on something that was captured, uh, but isn't ODR used, it should be as if it still was ODR used. So it's like mm. yeah, the decal type has wrong const. So it's not like uh, it's not the end of the world, I would say. But it's <laughs> if you want, to, I think it's uh, question 127. If you want to uh, to look at it later, <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's details like that, and I. I don't think that's a very particular, like, it's a, not a very interesting question in that case. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, sometimes stuff like that happens. And typically this happens when there are some really smart people who know a lot more C++ than me who contribute a question about some very esoteric stuff. I'd like to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Authors of the PVS Studio Analyzer suggest downloading and trying the demo version of the product. Link to the distribution package is in the description of this podcast episode. You might not even be aware of the large number of errors and potential vulnerabilities that the PVS Studio Analyzer is able to detect. A good example is the detection of errors that are classed as CWE14 according to the Common Weakness Enumeration. Compiler removal of code to clear buffers. PVS Studio creators demonstrated the detection of such an error type, for example, in one of the latest articles, We Checked the Android Source Code by PVS Studio, or nothing is perfect. Link to this article is also in the description of this episode. PVS Studio works in Windows, Linux, and macOS environments. The tool supports the analysis of C, C++, and C Sharp code, and Java support is coming soon. Try it today. How many questions do you have in total on the site? Because when I was looking at it earlier, it said that you know I, I did one of them and then said one of 95 questions correctly. But you're saying there's at least 127. How, how many uh, are there? Yeah, no, there are 95 published questions. Uh, 95 published ones, okay. Yeah, so 127, that's including some spam I got before I set up uh, spam protection and some okay. questions that I refused. Uh, people often, uh, sometimes they contribute questions where the answer is just wrong, where they rely on ints always being 32 bits or yeah, rely on alignment and padding always being in a certain way because that's how they got it on their machine. And um, Yeah. So there's some of that, some spam, and yeah. And also some I've just uh, retracted later because they were unclear or stuff like that. So 95 published questions. I think I have 10 in the pipeline that I have reviewed but not published yet, and I probably I quite quite a lot of half-finished questions from myself. I try to prioritize when I get stuff in from other people that I uh, prioritize reviewing that first before I start making more myself, but uh, yeah. 
So how much do you think the questions tend towards the esoteric corner cases and how much do they tend towards practical, useful knowledge for C++ developers? Way too much towards esoteric. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I think that's often because people find that, like people who decide they're going to contribute to C++ quiz, those are a certain kind of people, I think, who are very <laughs> interested in esoteric things about C++. Like your normal C++ developer wouldn't probably... Uh, contribute questions to that site. So I think I, I kind of get a bias of who is actually going to contribute. So what I want to do is to try to get more simple questions in about practical stuff that you actually either you need or that's actually interesting and will, when you understand the answer, it's going to teach you something that you can use in other situations. And uh, I do have uh, like a difficulty setting. So each question is like easy, intermediate or expert. And I need to get more easy questions in so that I can put up a filter so it can say only show me the easy questions or only show me easy and intermediate questions. Uh, because then a lot more people, I think, will find it useful and not just give up. Right. Uh, I often I give up myself on questions uh, that I get submitted from other people. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I need to get more simple questions in. But I also sometimes get people contributing a question such as says, like, see out uh, high and that's, mm -hmm. the, like, that's too simple. It has to be, it has to be at least two, two ways of reasoning, and it's almost like yeah. That, you have to be able to uh, to think of at least a few alternatives that could be the, the answer of the program. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For, if it just says uh, see out high, then it's it's there's no point. So there has to be some sort of thing that you have to understand because either it's this, then it's A, or or, or it's the other way around, and then you get B or something. It has to be something you can be tricked by kind of but it can be it can be much simpler things than which which uh, function is going to be found by a template when it's not it hasn't been instantiated yet but it's dependent on some other template that's like yeah 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 a lot of the questions are like that and it's, it's just too hard for for people who don't actually actually implement compilers i think right including including me uh, i don't <laughs> implement compilers and i don't understand their questions either Plus, well, it takes me it takes me four hours to understand and and write, rewrite the answer to refer to the standard. I'm I'm curious though, since you said um, uh, some of the questions make assumptions about alignment or the, about the size of an integer, that kind of thing, and I wonder how much your exposure to the CPP quiz is going to affect the way you actually program in C++. Like, are you going to be like super like defensive programming all the time? Or do you like know the places where you need to be concerned about all these things or? I don't know. I think it's made me more afraid of C++. <laughs> <And> it's, <laughs> That's terrible. It's, it's kind of uh, an important fear, <laughs> I would say, that I try to impose on my coworkers, uh, but yeah, it, you have to be careful with C++ because yeah, I had I had a lecture when I start, started with C++ in college, and he, uh, when someone asked, so how how does this work? He would often say, try, try, right. try it out and, and find out how it works. And that's the worst advice they can give about C++ because if you try something, it's not necessarily you don't necessarily get the correct answer. Uh, so is a, does a local variable always get initialized? Oh, yeah, because you happen to get your memories here out because before you started the program. And then people think, okay, yeah, so my, okay. All variables are zero and initialized, for instance. So, yeah, a little, a little bit of healthy fear of the language, I think, is, uh, is good. That's, that's interesting and a little sad at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've been thinking, like, I've been writing a few other languages and people have said you should make one for C Sharp or for Python or something and I don't think there are many languages that would be so easy to to make that kind of quiz for because I don't think I can't think of at least any other language that's so complex and so full of undefined behavior and complex corner cases and weird stuff mm. uh, yeah I, I've did, seen some of those like uh, posts online like programmer humor like what does JavaScript do here? You know, yeah. things like <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, one yeah. equal equal, you know, quotes around one, things like that. You, yeah. you could make some fun ones with JavaScript. Yeah, the, the the Watt uh, talk by Gary Burnout. For, uh, yes, yeah. it's great. That's a classic. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so there are there are things in other languages as well, but C plus is just so huge and so yeah. strange. Yeah. Yeah. What? So, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, if our listeners aren't familiar with the talk we're talking about, uh, I, I what's his name again? Who who did that JavaScript what talk? Uh, Gary Bernard. Okay. Um, and it's uh, if I recall, like a lightning talk. It's only like ten minutes long or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, go it's from, watch uh, his, it. <laughs> Destroy all software is his uh, his uh, vlog kind of thing. Okay. So yeah, if you if you search for Destroy all software and uh, what W A T, then you'll probably find it. It is it is a very very entertaining, well done lightning talk. Yes, it's one of the most entertaining ones I've seen. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Rob. I was going to put a link to that one in the show notes. Um, I was just going to say, so you've been running the site for about five years now. Uh, do you have a Patreon or anything to help you with uh, website hosting fees? Uh, no. Uh, I, maybe I should. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, like, yeah, when I, a few months ago, I figured out I'm going to go back into C++. I started uh, watching C++ Weekly, and I noticed mm. the Patreon thing you know, was going there, and I might try to do something similar. It's not very expensive, so since it's, a, it's just a shared server in Amsterdam, it's not like a big cloud data center uh, <laughs> thing. Uh, so, uh, but still, it, it would be helpful to yeah for hosting fees and maybe to help like with buying new versions of the standard and yeah some other costs. So, uh, yeah. It's interesting that it's a shared a hosted server in Amsterdam. You've said that a couple times. Is it just, you know, so controversial you needed to put it into a neutral country or something like that? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's because that's their Europe data center. Uh, so I, I'm using uh, someone called Web Faction. Okay. And I would just say they are great. I mean, they, they have a really great support. Uh, so, yeah. I have no idea if they're cheap or expensive or anything. I set it up five years ago and I haven't really compared to anyone else since then. Right. Every time I have a question, I send them an email and uh, they fix it in like 20 minutes on a Sunday. Uh, and uh, it's really great support. So I yeah. really recommend Web Faction if you need similar stuff like this. That's cool. Have you had any problems with like when you get like posted on Reddit or anything like uh, server performance degrading or anything like that? Uh, no. Um, That's cool. Yeah. I Well, it, it, the site is very lightweight and... Uh, the other thing is that people don't click around a lot. I mean, you click on a question and then you look at that one for five minutes and <laughs> before you click the next link. That's true. Uh, right. So I don't remember the numbers, but I looked at my, I have some Google Analytics stuff and I like the average visitor time is like 12 minutes or something. And that's including everyone who just clicks away. So most people, they stay there for a really long time and they don't click that many links. <laughs> like so, an hour writing out the thing, trying it on uh, compiler explorer trying to figure out what it's doing <laughs> yeah yeah no it's yeah i haven't any had any issues with that but i i don't think i've gotten like that huge amount of traffic either so you recently announced that uh you're putting on an effort to try to get all the questions updated to c plus plus 17 is that right yeah uh so everything has been c plus 11 and all the questions have typically from one to five references to the standard so I figured at some point I need to start targeting C++ 17. And some of the answers might actually have changed. Uh, and one of the more esoteric questions was about, was about the trigraphs, for instance. So that one just mm. had to be, uh, be changed completely. And all the other ones had to update section numbers and quotes and all that. And the, the big part for me was I was thinking I might spend months doing this because I don't know which of the questions actually now are, have a different answer. Than they had back in the day. So I basically would have to re-review all the questions. <laughs> uh, so when I uh, knew I was going to be on CPPcast, I thought, hey, I have to prepare a way for the community to help so I can ask people for help uh, while I'm here. Uh, but instead of doing that, I will say that everything is now ported to C++17 because within a few hours, people started uh, contributing. Wow. And uh, Simon Brand, who was here a few weeks ago, he ported mm -hmm. some questions and... Uh, Niklas Lesser from Germany, he ported uh, like 90 questions over the weekend. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> 90? So, yeah, that was it. Yeah. I, it was, I was thinking I would spend months, but it took four days because uh, mostly of Niklas Lesser and also Simon Brand. And I, I had time to port maybe seven questions myself before they were just finished with everything. <laughs> so I was just amazed by the, yeah, the effort. Yeah, that's a... 
great community effort. Yeah. yeah. Well, so uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about CPP reference is how you can see whether something was uh, pre C++ 11, 11, 14, 17, 20, whatever that's tagged on there. Have you considered leaving around the C++ 11 versions of the question so that the, you know, if someone is on C++ 11 in their actual daily work, they could say, I want to see the C++ 11 version and then show me how it's changed or something like that? And that would actually be fun. Uh, turns out it's only a few questions that actually changed. But, okay. Uh, the explanation for the answer being correct is sometimes in a completely different part of the standard than it used to be. Right. Uh, so, like the like the one I mentioned with um, with if you put decal type on a captured variable that isn't ODR used, mm -hmm. it should act as if it was ODR used. But like that's now that it used to be in the lambda thing, and now it's in the decal type thing. Or so like things move around, and it's but it's it hasn't really changed that much. So I'm not sure if it's worth the effort. Okay. But uh, it's mostly just the quotes are different and the section numbers are different. Uh, we also had someone suggest we can just leave the questions for C plus eleven and then use C plus for the seventeen for the new questions and then it says like this question is for eleven, this one is for seventeen. Uh, but I think that would be more confusing. So it was better to make the effort and port everything and especially when uh, Nicholas and Simon <laughs> did all the work. It was <laughs> 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 yeah, it was very much. Uh, I think I I spent more time preparing for setting it up for the community to help them actually. Uh, I spent doing any of the actual work myself. So most of the time went, uh, that I put into it was just uh, making scripts to export everything to a Git repo so that people could make pull requests and writing readmes and making sure that everything was easy for contributors. And it looks like that paid off at least. Cool. That's great. Uh, do you have any plans to update the site now that everything's in C++17? Uh, just yeah, publish more questions try to get more questions that are simple, not not like entirely trivial, but simpler so that we can have some filtering. So it's easier for people who aren't compiler implementers to actually get more questions right. Uh, because I think it's too hard for most people. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, the main plan. Um, yeah, the, the Patreon suggestion you had, uh, I might do that. And uh, also maybe trying to find some way to have other moderators than only myself, uh, both to help moderate other people's questions, but also to have someone re review my own before I publish them and have Twitter <laughs> review them uh, afterwards, as it happens now. I have a feature suggestion. Uh, yeah. Maybe have a way to open up Compiler Explorer from CPP Quiz to like see the answer kind of work in a compiler. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good idea. I wonder if I added an issue for that actually, or if I didn't do it yet. Uh, if not, I'll I'll do that later. Just yeah, some way of going directly to. Uh... No, that was for my blog. I I didn't think about it for C++, because, but yeah, that's a good idea. Unless you consider it cheating, then. <laughs> well, you could do it when, once you've answered the right answer, or yeah. say you give up. Yeah. Or well, one thing we haven't discussed is you actually have hint levels, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. So you could potentially have a, like on the second level hint. Here's go go and play with this in the compiler or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a good idea as well. Actually, writing the hints is one of the most difficult things because it's not that often. It's not very. There's not a lot of things going on. It's, I try to always keep it to like there's one thing going on in each question. So there might be some like surrounding stuff, but there's it, there's every question is supposed to only ask about one one specific thing. And it's really hard to give a hint many, many times about the thing without giving it away. Right. Um, yeah. So at this point, do you have reasonable hints for all the questions? Yeah, all questions have hints, and I, th I okay. think they're pretty, pretty okay. Uh, yeah. But often when I get contributors con contributing questions, they say they fill in for the hint field. They just say, I, "Sorry, I couldn't think of a hint." And <laughs> I and I completely understand because it's it can be hard to. To, uh, to to give a hint without giving everything away, right? But often it's if often it will be think about this very very specific thing. How does that work? To like draw your attention to what the question is really about, rather than really helping you that much. But yeah. 
Do you have any favorite question, either user contributed or one you came up with on your own? Um, I like uh, my favorite questions are the ones where people have got it correct <laughs> when they <laughs> contribute something, and they have uh, where they have put in references to the standard. Because often it's like, here's an explanation of what's going on, and I have to figure out, is that actually what's going on? Or is it what they think is going on? Uh, so I often spend a lot of time... I spend some time in the standard, and a lot of time also on CPP reference and Stack Overflow. That's actually one, one tip I could like give for people who try to figure out how things really go on. Like, Don't always start reading the standard in the beginning. Like, first go to Stack Overflow, go to CPP reference, so you get some idea of things, and then you know better what to look for in the standard because it's really hard to read the standard very often. But uh, yeah, so favorite questions. Uh, if they're yeah, correct, they're referring to the standard and it's not too esoteric. And, and you can learn something useful about the language. Maybe that exact question isn't that useful, but while understanding the answer, you will learn something uh, interesting. So uh, one that I recently got in was uh, about, um, it's question 217, uh, and it's, it's about the conditional operator. So if you, have an, uh, if you have an int i, and then you have a conditional operator saying, if, uh, if i is larger than zero, the result is i, otherwise it's one. So the result could, can either be i itself, or it can be an, uh, a literal. Okay. And then you bind a reference to the result of the conditional operator. Okay. So, yeah, so we have a reference that either is bound to i itself or to a literal. And then the question is, is that reference actually bound to i when i is the result of the conditional uh, uh, operator? And the thing you need to, because then you get to think about like, okay, does it need to make a temporary? And you get like, you can talk a bit about uh, like the difference between a reference and a value and uh, because uh, the thing is that the, the conditional operator either returns i itself or a literal. So you can't actually refer, you can't return a reference because if it is the literal that's the answer, then that literal will go out of scope, so you can't bind a reference to that. But you can bind a reference, a const reference to a literal. Uh, yeah, but but you have to return something from the conditional expression itself, and that, in this case, has to be actually a PR value and not... Okay. Yeah, so it's a bit hard to <laughs> explain code without looking at code, I think. But uh, uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a very, very simple question. Uh, it's, there are four lines in main, and that's it. And you get to think a little bit about like, yeah, types and what can you bind references to and not. And uh, yeah, it's a const reference you bind, but uh, yeah, you have to make a PR value. It's sort of like also uh, the post and pre-increment operators where one of them has to make a copy because it has to actually be able to return the value as it was before you incremented. And things like that, that it seems like a corner case, but it gets you thinking a bit about how does the language actually work. Right. Um, yeah, so I like I like those. Well, you, you recently blogged about one involving virtual destructors that caught my attention. Yeah. Uh, I guess recently. Yeah, well, back in March, so six months ago. Um, it, well, it... It, I guess I got the answer wrong when I was started reading your blog. I'm like, oh, of course I know the answer to that. So, would you mind um, describing this particular one to your, uh, to the listeners? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll just bring the code up here. Uh, so the, the thing is, uh, if you, uh, if you have a base class and a derived class, and you de delete, so you have an instance of the derived class, and then you mm -hmm. delete it through a pointer to the base class. Uh, and you don't have a virtual destructor, what happens? So uh, the, so, what the, the, the person who submitted the question said that, okay, if you, if you delete a derived class by a pointer to the base class and the destructor isn't virtual, it's only going to destroy the base part of the object and not the derived part. Right. And I think that's probably what everyone is going to see their compiler doing. But actually, it's undefined behavior. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. in undefined behavior to delete a derived class through a base class pointer if the destructor isn't virtual. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the person who submitted the question said it's going to only call the destructor for the base class object. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but then I thought, okay, I have to, I have to check. So I had, went to the standard and read and I found, hey, it says right there, uh, it's undefined behavior. 
Yeah, I did not realize that was undefined behavior. Yeah. I thought it was defined that it would just delete the base part. Yeah. It says, uh, if the static type of the object to be deleted is different from its dynamic type, the static type shall be a base class of the dynamic type, uh, and the static type shall have a virtual destructor, or the behavior is undefined. And as far as I know, no compiler will warn on that unless you have some other virtual function to create a vtable in the first place, and then it'll warn that you didn't provide a virtual destructor. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know, actually. But uh, yeah, it's it's a very good example of of a thing that sounds just it sounds right, and it's not. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's why I, this one was interesting, I think. And if I recall, your comment in your blog posting made a lot of sense. Like, how can we reason about an object that wasn't properly destroyed? Yeah. So, so if, it, it, if you if you say that okay, this is actually a well defined behavior. If you delete it without a virtual destructor, it will only destroy the base part of the object. How can you do that without leaving a lot of other stuff undefined? So, what happens with the stuff in the the right class? What happens to the memory? What happens to their destructors? Uh, what happens uh, like that should go out of scope what what happens with uh, RAI things you try to do in that class and so I think you could you could say that okay that's defined but after that then it's undefined something something more undefined is going to happen for sure but the thing of course with the UB is that if it ha if it happens at one point then the entire execution of your program is is undefined so if your program is running for two hours and then you get undefined behavior, then everything up to that was actually undefined behavior. Right. Uh, so it wouldn't really make sense to, to try to define this scenario. And uh, yeah, uh, that's one of the scary things about C++ as well. That's like, <laughs> if everything is fine up until a point and then, then it's not fine, then by definition, everything up until that was not fine either. And that's, of course, to be able to allow the compiler to do crazy optimizations. Uh, but it's yeah, it's scary stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the standard makes no guarantee about uh, the result of the program, including things that preceded the undefined behavior. Something yeah. like that is the wording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's why I don't think it would make sense to try to define this at all. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, is there anything else you wanted to go over before we let you go, Anders? Um. Well, uh, yeah, actually, one thing I would uh, would say is that uh, since I've now been looking for a job in Oslo uh, for a few months, I would just say, if you need an interesting C++ job, Oslo is great. I went to so many really cool places, people making really, really fancy stuff. Uh, I was really surprised about how much cool is going on in Oslo. Uh, so, yeah, we have Cisco making all their uh, video conferencing stuff in Oslo. Um, they have a lot of fun, it seems, and include OS. Uh, the C++ unikernel is made here. Oh, I didn't realize that. Uh, so I, I went talking to the, those guys as well, really cool people, very, very smart. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, Vivaldi is being made here. Um, Hudley, which is now the official Google Hangouts hardware camera, is being made here. Uh, yeah, and of course the oil and gas industry in Norway has lots of really crazy tech stuff. So uh, yeah, Oslo is really cool. And uh, the, my new company, Civid, where I will start in 1st of October, we make uh, machine vision stuff. So it's uh, they made the, like the world's most accurate 3D color camera. Uh, wow. So, that, so it's, it's mm. pretty, pretty cool. And uh, what I found really interesting was they're making hardware, so they're making eyes for robots, basically. And okay. so they made, like, the best hardware. And they said that's only half of what will get us to uh, to be, be the best. The other half is equally important. It's having the best API. Hmm. And I think that's kind of rare for a hardware company to say that the API is going to be just as important as the hardware to give us a business advantage. And uh, that was really one of the things that really sold me about that company. Like, it seems like a very interesting focus to have. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of embedded stuff going on in Oslo. And we talk to embedded people, they're always like, oh, the stuff I get from the hardware company is so shit. And we, uh, it's, uh, so yeah, so someone actually really, really making an effort to make a great API for hardware, I think. It seems to be uncommon, I think. That does sound uh, interesting. So yeah, yeah. Lots, of, lots of cool, uh, cool stuff going on in, in Oslo. And the C++ community here has been kind of dead for several years. 
But uh, Patricia, uh, uh, that we talked about earlier, she's really mm -hmm. bringing it back up again, and I plan to uh, to help out with that as well. And I think we're going to see see the, um, the community in Oslo be a lot more active going forward. Awesome. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, and are you planning to attend any of the upcoming conferences we've talked about? Uh, no, I currently I. Uh, I don't have a job because my new job right. doesn't start until in a few weeks. Right. So, uh, right. Yeah, my previous job wasn't in C++, so I've been like uh, away from everything. But I hope to go to more conferences. And I gave a talk uh, uh, at the little NDC Tech Town conference for a little. It was a few hundred, few hundred people a few weeks ago. But uh, yeah, I definitely hope to go to one of the bigger ones uh, soon. I guess on that mm -hmm. note, we should mention that you are running out of time very quickly to buy tickets to Pacific Plus Plus also, which is coming up here in October. And as we all know, CVP Con is coming up at the end of September, one week yep. after this airs, basically. Mm. Yep. Would it be okay to uh, to say that we're hiring at CIVID? Sure. Sure, why not? Yeah. You already did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're good with C++ or if you are good with machine vision... Uh, or uh, we also need people with uh, machine learning and AI stuff. So it seems like a really cool place to work. I haven't started there, so I can't make any guarantees, but it's uh, right. <laughs> sounds great. A lot of uh, cool uh, people. And also Sickle, that you had an episode about a few weeks ago with Simon Brand. Yes. Mm -hmm. if, if anyone knows Sickle or want to learn it, uh, we we're having some efforts in that direction as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Very cool, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I'm very glad that you're getting back to be a full-time C++ developer again, and it's been great having you on the show today. Yeah, it's really fun to be here. I'm just so glad to be back with C++, like with the community and uh, everything. It's, uh, yeah, I really, just really feel like I'm back in the right place. Oh, well, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in, or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Lefticus on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.